Sean, thanks very much for joining us. Not at all, pleasure. Yes, thank you. Pleasure. We'll just dip right in, all right? Yeah, sure. Right. So, what acting practitioner's te technique, if any, do you subscribe to? Well, I didn't do, I didn't train as an actor because there wasn't really any available to me as, as when I started off. I went to UCG, Galway, well, it's now NUIG, it's called, uh, to do a degree. I did a degree in a HDIP to, with a view to being a teacher. And while I was there, um, this company called Druid Theatre had just started, and there was a couple of, you know, the, the people who started Druid were part, came from, from college as well. And in my time in college, I, like my four years in college, I didn't do, I wasn't involved in drama at all until the last year. Like I played football, not very well, but I played football at college. And then in my final year, I did a one act play. And we did three performances uh, in the college theatre. And just as luck would have it, Marie Mullen and Gary Hines from Druid happened to be in the audience. And a few days later, I was walking down the street and this woman <laughs> approached me said, are you Sean McGinney? And I said, yeah. He said, would you like to do an audition for Druid? And I thought she was joking, but she wasn't. So I did an audition for Druid and I ended up doing one play, just for one play, and then another one, and then another one. And that was in 1977, so here we are. And had you any right. inkling before that, that you were going to act anything at Not all? Not at all. Or no. with act, even when you're younger, did well, you do accents or my, anything? No, my mother was a teacher. A uh, primary school teacher, and she was a very good teacher. And she used to use drama to, you know, she maybe ahead of her time in that way. Mm -hmm. So she, for history and geography and English and stuff, any 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 opportunity she had at all, she'd get us all all the kids in the classroom. And it was a one room class school, you know, country school in North Leitrim. Um, so so we 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 did plays a lot in school. And there's a drama festival at home in Ballyshannon every year, still running. So I think it's the longest running one in country now. So we used to go and see plays all the time. But the idea of being an actor was like equivalent to being a you know an astronaut. You know, it was not it was not a possibility as a way of making a living. So it was like it wasn't and even when I was in college and even when I did the first couple of plays with Druid, I never thought, well, you know, when is the real world going to <coughs> come? You know, when when am I going to have to get a real job? And we just, we just kept, but it was like that with Druid in the early days that we, we were always reading plays collectively and talking about them and saying maybe we should do this, maybe we should do that. But we could, we could make a decision very quickly, you know, if, we, if something really grabbed us, we'd, we'd end up doing it, you know. I mean, we didn't think too far ahead. Well, so do you think it was easier back then to produce stuff like that? Or has it got harder? Or? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Uh, like when, we, when Druid started off, um, there wasn't much in the way of support. Like the town, Galway City were great. I mean, the local local businesses and local people in the round Druid were fantastically supportive. Some of the, you know, we used to get supplies for making costumes and, you know, and they were really generous and really supportive and really helpful. And, but I think the standard of the work was pretty good from the beginning. So I think maybe local people knew there was something interesting going on, you know, and then, Galway Corporation came in with a, you know, some kind of grant and then the Arts Council eventually. But it took a while before uh, the national newspaper started coming down to review shows. You know, it took, we had to go to the, we went to the Edinburgh Festival in 1980 and won a fringe first and the Denon, the band, they won the, the thing for best music. Mm -hmm. So, and they, they played live in the show, which was extraordinary. It was like having the Rolling yeah, Stones on stage. Stone, so really? we were there for two weeks. It was, among the two best weeks of our lives, I think, collectively. But after that, it created a big stir. And then, you know, I think our, our profile leapfrog, leapfrogged at that stage and, or, you know, it became much bigger. And then we were able to, like from, from a company that did, every, you know, a small group of people, the few, few act, four or five core actors, Gary, Marie, uh, we did, like I built the sets, Melissa Stafford, you know, I was an actor and built sets. Melissa Stafford was an actor and he did a lot of the electrical stuff and lighting stuff. Marie uh, did costumes and also did the financial end of the company. And Gary was directed all the plays and uh, was the CEO, sort of, a, you know, just general manager of the company. So we did everything ourselves. But after Edinburgh, uh, you know, 
things we, we just things got better and we were able to employ a you know a full time production manager or like somebody to do to build sets and uh, an administrator and all that so that so the infrastructure of the company kind of expanded and uh, so, so yeah so I, I don't know I, I'm, I think it's always hard to start I think it's always hard to start but the way to start is just do it that's right do it, get friends or do it, join an amateur drama group or group in college or Get a bunch of friends together, do readings. You know, just do it. That's that's the key. Just and what do were it. you doing in between then? That's that's a big question. In between, like whenever you were. So had you graduated at this time? Or? I I I I did my BA, and I, the year I joined Druid, I was doing the H Dip. So you were still a student so was, when you were yeah, in Yeah, I was Druid. a full time member of Druid and doing the H Dip at the same time. Now it doesn't say much about the H Dip, to be honest, um, at the time. So I got I passed my. So I got got on that, you know. So, so you, you have you have your teaching? I have, I have, but I never used it. So because I, you know, I've been doing this ever since. So. So you've been you've been working. your you are a working actor. You've not stopped. No. So since 1977, so 42 years ago, uh, to the, this month actually, March 77, I joined Druid. So I was like, I've been looking at like. You know, the first 10 years of my working life was exclusively with Druid. And then uh, in 1986, so nine years, uh, Gary Hines was invited by the Abbey to do a production for the Dublin Theatre Festival in 1986. So she picked a, a Tom Murphy play called Whistle in the Dark and she brought a couple of actors from Druid with her to do that and I was one of those. So we ended up doing that <coughs> in the Abbey. And then uh, that was a big success, like it was critically really well received and um, it was good for everybody involved and that production transferred into to London, went to the Royal Court to the Lift Festival and it was very well received there so you know everybody kind of came out of that whole experience. Very yeah, well. the collective and it, one then. Yeah, and it intensified our relationship with Tom Murphy, the writer as well. Well, we'd worked with him a bit before that as well, but I think that was um, that was one of the best things Drew's ever done. I think, or well, that we've ever been involved in, as regards a Murphy play, you know. So yeah, yeah. whoever around. Well, have, have you noticed any differences in the industry since you started? Well, um, training is a big thing. You know, there, there is now training. Like there's the layer, and there's they, they had a performance course in Trinity for a while, but I think it's an academic course now. Not, and the, I, I suppose the, well. the Gaiety School of Acting, but none of those things existed in, when I was starting off. The, the Abbey had a school for a while, but that was, well, it wasn't about when I was when I was starting. It wasn't available. So, so that, so there's, so, and I think the, I suppose there's more activity with TV and film as well than there was back then. There was so nothing going on. When did you find the bounce from? Doing the, the Druid Theatre work, and then getting into <coughs> film and TV. Well, it was uh, partly uh, by that stage. You know, by the early nineties, I got married in ninety ninety, and my wife also being an actress. We all we 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 talked about what would happen. You know, then we had a kid in ninety one, and then we 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 thought it well, was more of an aspiration really than anything else that we would try not to both work at the same time. Especially theatre, because theatre is so time consuming. And it's, you know, financially it's difficult to, to make a living just from doing theatre. So I kind of stepped back a bit from theatre, and recontinued doing theatre, and then basically it worked out, you know, that whoever got the job offer first would take the job and the other person would kind of step back. And, you know, we kind of, we kind of it was kind of like a dance in that way, but. We, we kind of, so I ended up, that's kind of why I ended up doing more film and TV than theatre. Uh, and, you know, when you do one, it leads to, an, you know, it often leads to another. And that's kind of how, like, Marie has hardly done any film or TV, you know. Uh, but that's just the way. She's, I mean, she's just never stops with theatre, so. Well, going on from that, you mentioned yeah. TV. Do you think there's a different skill set needed for, between theatre? I don't and know. I think maybe the technicalities are slightly different, but I think the acting is the same. I think it's about listening, always. 
and you, you know the quality of the writing is number one. So you you figure out what the writer is on about, and then then give it yourself, give yourself to it, and by 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 definition, if you give yourself to it, it's going to be different to anybody else's interpretation of it. But be true to the writing, number one. Listen to what's going on around you as well. You know, those two things are quite simple, fundamental, and they apply to theatre, film, TV, anything, you know, I think. Uh, and when you see, like when you see, when you go to, go to a play and you see actors that are really listening to each other as a member of the audience, you're, you're going to listen as well. And if they're not really listening, you're not going to be listening either, you know. I mean, you can act listening, you know. I'm Do you not, think that's I'm acting listening now. I'm not listening to you, but I'm acting listening. But I'm listening to you now. You know, there's a, there is a difference and people can tell, you know. People, I think the audience can tell. And that's why they lose interest? That's the I, well, there, there may be many reasons yeah. they lose interest, but that, that would be, that's one of the most common ones, I think. Actors not listening to each other, I think. Yeah. Uh, for what it's worth. Uh, so I want to ask you about one of your projects, which has been the first thing I seen you. Yeah. Was John B. Keynes, the field. Oh, the field, yeah. And what was it like working with Mr. Harris? Absolutely terrifying. It was my first. That was my first film. First time ever on a film set. Yeah. So on the first day of filming, as well, was in the priest's house where Harris gives that big speech about the last, stunning. That was my first. And it was it was brilliant to watch because here you're looking at a master craftsman in action, and you know he gave it, and I'm thinking I have no business being here. I was just trying to, okay, don't don't mess it up. Don't you know when your cue comes, don't forget the freaking line. It's, it's you know anyway. It was and the because coming from theatre, we have a rehearsal process. You have four. Five week, maybe if you're lucky, rehearsal process with the other actors and you work towards the beginning, which is the opening. That's only the beginning of the journey. You, through the run, if it's any good, it should evolve, you know. Um, but in film, you don't really have any rehearsal. You might have a read through, a tape, all the cast, and that might be the only time all the cast ever meet during that first read too, through. And then, if you're lucky, you might have little bits of rehearsal, a uh, little bit of chat about. But you sh basically you show up and you do it. So that was a bit of a shock to the system. And then the technical side of it, like just lights and sound and people walking across in the middle of, sh you know, in your eye You know, you to, it's a different way of concert. So you have to focus. Uh, well, you know, I, I mean, I know now what I should have done. You know, back then, there was, you know, you know, when you're starting off like that, it's just bewildering. So you have to, um, I mean, the overall experience was good because I, I got to work with great people like Harris and John Hart and John Bean and Brenda Fricker and Tom Berenger and, you know, uh, like loads of fantastic people. But it's such an Irish speech for you to witness as your first Oh, year. yeah. Like yeah. the land is such yeah. a big it's, part. Well, it's, it's, that's, that's all of Irish drama. That's, you look at, you're from the country yourself. I'm from sort of a small town. Northwest. My father came from, you know, the land, the, our attachment to the land and given our history and all the rest of it is is uh, fundamental to who we are still, you know. Offered to be part of a project. Uh, what is it that attracts you first to it? Now, I know the writing is essential. That'll be number one, definitely. Mm. Uh, depending on what it is, you know, if it, if it was a film or a TV thing, the director would have a big bearing on it, who the director was. You know, sometimes you've worked with directors before and if they ask you, you, you don't even read the script, you say, okay, you know, because you've worked with them before and you know that it's going to be, you know, you can trust them and all that. Um, and the people, you know, the other actors too. <clears throat> uh, so it's a very, you know, it's a combination of different things. You know. And is there any young, young directors that you're looking out that you would like to work with? Uh, well, you know, I'm doing a play at the moment um, in the gate up there and you know, we worked with a young director called Una Murphy. So, you know, she's nice and she's just starting off and I'd be interested to see what she does next, you know. One, so this is off off the acting track, but yeah. there and thereabouts. Do you uh, have a certain philosophy that you live by? 
Uh, not really. Uh, you know, I, I remember a friend of mine who's a Scottish fella talking to his son. And he was just giving him general advice for life. Don't be a dick. <laughs> so I thought, you know, that's not a bad motto to live by. You know, I don't. You know, it was like a lot of people were brought up in as Catholic and all that stuff. And you know, if if people lived actually lived by the tenets of Christianity, the world would be a much better place. But you know, it's become so uh, corrupted by human vanity and all that. You know, I mean, the church is uh, it's preposterous. You know, you. Men in freaking handmade silk robes, driving around in bulletproof cars, talking about you know uh, frugality and humility and modesty and I mean it's ludicrous. But then when you meet people like uh, when my daughters were in primary school and it was a, an all girls Catholic school they went to, the chaplain to the school, a, a, a lovely man called Father Owen Sweeney from Donegal, I think he's still with it, but he, he hasn't been well lately, but. Uh, one of the most extraordinary people I've ever met in my life. Total, he lives the life of Christianity, like non-judgmental, compassionate, wise, understanding, loves kids, like loves, just loves the world in general and just throws his arms out to the world and you're thinking, okay, <laughs> now if that's a priest, yeah, okay. That's, but I think he'd be like that whether he was a priest or not, you know, I think. So, so I don't, you know, I, I, you know I, ironically, I love nothing better than sitting in the back of a church. I mean, there are beautiful spaces. There's a beautiful kind of serenity about them. But I also know that, you know, there's an incredible, I don't know, vanity about these things as well, so. Now, <coughs> A lot of actors nowadays, they like to base their characters' movement on animals. Have you ever done this with your role? Not, not consciously, no. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, this thing about methods of acting and all this, a lot, there's a lot, a lot of the, like the media use the method. They talk about method acting. And they don't know what they're talking about, actually. They don't know what that means. Uh, you, know, you know, if you be specific, it's, you know, a method that was, evolved by, among others, Stanislavski and in America, then they, they refined it further with Lee Strasberg and the, the actor studio and people like Brando and De Niro and others uh, went there. But, you know, I often think, you know, I'd say if, if you know, Brando went to the tech in Athlone and studied metalwork and then decided to become an actor, he'd been just as good an actor as he was having gone through the actors too. I, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of myth. I think every actor has their own way of doing things, and I think whatever works is fine by me. You know, and I know people who are so-called method actors who are absolutely fantastic, and I know method actors who are maybe not so fantastic. So it's it's down to what works and what keeps you truthful. Well, when they're actually living, like saying that they are living that character the whole time throughout a shoot is, is that can that get in the way of it's not well I, I, in my experience i worked with an actor who uh stayed in you know and he was playing an american and he had he had this fantastic american accent but between shots we were chatting about football and donegal football and but he was still in, in character and it wasn't a distraction because then when the director says action he's ready to go he doesn't have to prepare He's ready all the time to go. And if that works, you know, great. Uh, I, I think it's what, what you need to do, whatever you need to do to do the job and be, you know, be part of a company as well, you know. I mean, you know, if it's getting in the way of things, then, then maybe you shouldn't do it, you know. Or if it's upsetting other people, well, maybe you should find a, a way that isn't, you know. Because we're all trying to work together. We're all trying to... Uh, work towards the same same point, you know, so I, th I think it's it's a word that's used a bit lazily in the media method or you know, sell them, right? Yeah, and you know th these these sort of Tags that they put on you know lobbies and all that. I mean they are generalizations and they don't really mean much There are you know our souls in every walk of life, you know, and you'll meet them in acting and you'll meet them in 
you know, in the media or sports or business or, you know, every, you know, so I think you have to ignore all that stuff, really, and just do, do what, try and be faithful to the writer and give yourself to it, be yourself in it, you know, channel yourself through it. By definition, that makes it unique on the region, you know, if you do that. So, is it, do you think the internet's changing the way people work? And advertise themselves as artists. Or? Well, I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm, you know, I kind of miss that sort of, you know, I, I, I you know, now I, the the audition process for film is everything is self taping now, and it's it's becoming like that for theatre as well. Like people are self taping for theatre auditions as well, and um, I don't know, uh, I have mixed feelings about it. I think uh, the 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 difficulty for me with self taping is like it normally in. Uh, old time auditions, like where you'd have the director or the casting director there, you could have a little bit of chat about what they want, or is that a bit too, this, okay, I'll try it this way, you know, you're a little bit of, there's no, there isn't that two-way sort of street going yeah. on. Uh, yeah. So it's like, you have to kind of imagine, again, you have to focus on the writing, and then just give it your best shot and hope for the best. Uh, but I suppose it's, it's good in the sense that, you know, before a lot of the time you'd have to fly to London to, to do an audition, now you can do it, you can bang it off, you can do it on your phone nearly. Yeah. Uh, you can, you know, you can bang it off that way, but I don't know, it, it's it's become a little bit less personal. I, I found that with something I was doing personally, you know, you would get to the recall stage and <coughs> I would say, if I could just get into the room. Exactly. You know, that yeah. that's that's the frustrating thing is that yeah, when that, you're there, you, know, you can't be in to talk, as yeah. you just said. I think they use, uh, they, they use the self-tape thing as a kind of a, a calling me mechanism. So they, they'll go, no, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we'll call them back, you know, and you might get to meet them the second time around or, or something, or you might even get a Skype. Yeah. Audition. I did a Skype audition there recently. Skype. Yeah. Well, uh, Republic of Doyle. Oh yeah. <laughs> that was a long. So you done a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. It was. Um, uh, it turned out to be six seasons. Yeah. So f over five years, um, or five and a half years. So that came out of the blue. Just um, this guy called Alan Harko. He's a, an actor uh, from. St. John's in Newfoundland, but he was based in Toronto. And his story was, he, he went to their National Theatre School and ended up in Toronto as a freelance actor, job and actor, and, and doing, he was doing very well because he's very good. Um, but he said he found himself once too often, or many times too often, in a bar at two o'clock in the morning, giving out about the theatre scene in Toronto, and it's too safe, and it's too tame, and it's too this, and it's too that. And instead of, you know, doing what I would have done, just keep moaning, <laughs> he kind of went out the next day and <clears throat> with a few friends of his, they f he formed his own theatre company. And <clears throat> then they started looking around for a play that might, might shake things up a bit. And he started reading all sorts of stuff. But he came across this play called A Whistle in the Dark by Tom Murphy. And he got, uh, looked around for a direct, somebody from here to direct it, so Jason Byrne. Well, I've never worked with, but uh, got him over to direct it. It was a huge sensation in Toronto, it, like it kind of because of the nature of the play and by all accounts it was a very good production. So on the, on the strength of that, like he kind of got this newfound confidence. He said, "Well, I've always wanted to do a TV show about a private eye or a, you know, a, yeah, a private eye, set in my hometown." So he went to the CBC with an idea for a pilot. And he pitched it on, you know, on the back of the confidence he got from this. So they greenlit the pilot, they shot the pilot, half an hour. And on the basis of the pilot, they said, OK, we, we give you a series. So they, so they decided to recast some of the key roles in the, from the pilot. So they went looking for somebody to play his dad. And they went to London and Scotland and Dublin. And <coughs> we... We came in anyway, and you know the audition went well. And then we started chatting, and he said uh, he knew that I played the same part in Whistle in the Dark that he had, and he said that part changed my life. He said to him, he said the same thing happened to me. That part changed my life too. So we kind of bonded, and I kind of knew I probably had a fairly good chance of getting this, and we did. So I thought it was just 
do one season of it, and that's it. But it kept getting greenlit and greenlit. Uh, and then after, at, the, at the end of season six, we kind of talked about it and said, look, I think we should quit this while we're ahead, before we're asked to stop. So we did. And that was a, that was a good call, too. And it was a great time. Uh, been in Newfoundland for five and a half months of the year. Um, the loveliest people. It's a beautiful place. It's like very like the west of Ireland, except for the more pine trees. So multicoloured all the... the yeah, the, the houses in St John's are all... It's like, yeah, the wood wood framed yeah. houses and they're almost... Like the harbour, a stunning looking place. Like it's just stunning. There's these, this hiking trail in the middle of the city. It goes around, you know, by the cliffs and all the rest of it. And it's, it's very like, like I, I lived in Galway for a long time and it reminded me a lot of Galway in the 70s in a good way, you know, the, the sense of community there and welcome and friendliness and wit and same dark humour that we have and all that. I loved, absolutely loved the place and I made a lot of good friends there, you know, still keep in contact with them. So, so how did you find the, find the accent there? Very, very difficult because it's, 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 very, it's very close to a Wexford accent. But it isn't. So but did you find because you're Irish, obviously we are already rotic, so we can go there easier than. I found it difficult, uh, and I'm usually fairly good at accents, but luckily we had a very good dialect coach, uh, a woman called Janine Pearson, who, one of the best I've ever come across. She, she, she'd worked with Alan in the theatre school, and he got her in to teach. Well, most of the actors were not from Newfoundland, so they were either American or Canadian, or like myself, Irish. So, uh, and you know, I wanted to do. You know, they they could have had the the father come from Ireland, but I, Alan and myself agreed that we'd like to have him as a Newfoundlander. So I were I did a lot of work on the accent, and I got it in the end. But I found it really hard because it's so close to our own. Like so, the vowel sounds are. Uh, you know, you, you you would find yourself sometimes. Wondering whether it yeah, but we had this really really great dialect coach for the so for the first season first season and a half, she was there all the time and we'd work we'd go through every word of the script and work it and she had great she did a lot of research locals you know so a lot of variety of uh, accents to pick you know so it's it's um, it's it's I mean some of, like the people from way down south in the Avalon Peninsula sound like you could drop them in Wexford and they'd sound like locals. But the people in the city, there's a North American kind of uh, twang to it, you know, but it's still very, like to, to non-Newfoundland ears, they would think, oh, you know, like Americans would think they're Irish, or even Cana mainland Canadians would think Newfoundlanders are Irish, but they're not, you know, and the accent is subtly different. So, so. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a nice challenge, but we got it in the end. Um, so if you had any advice for any young actor, aside from just do it, yeah. Yeah, close to that, but if you, could, if you could put acting into one sentence, what it needs, how would you say that? Oh, uh, one sentence. Um, I just think, Listen and learn. So by learn, I mean really figure out what the writer is up to. You know, it's about, you know the, the the top quality writers. The more you the more you pay attention to what they do, the more they give you. And when you do it right, you know when you do it right in the sense that if you observe the structure of what they're written, the punctuation, all that sort of stuff. When you do that, it makes it easy. When you're struggling with, if you're struggling with, whether it be Shakespeare or Singer or Casey or Murphy or Friel or Beginnis or Sam Shepard or whoever, all the, those are all great writers. And if you're struggling, if you find this isn't working, just go back to the text because because the answer is there always. Uh, and then just when you do that, you know, listen to what's going on around you, pay attention to what's going on around you, and to be able to do that properly, you you really need to to know your own stuff to the extent that you can forget about it. So you're not thinking about your own stuff all the time. You're, you're, you're looking out, you're listening. 
What's he doing? What's she doing? What's she saying? And pay attention to the person in possession. You know, you know, where where is the focus supposed to be in this scene? If it's supposed to be there, be there. If it's on you, do what you have to do, and then give the ball to somebody else. You know, that's that analogy is. Um, it's support the player in possession at all times. And sometimes it's the collective, sometimes it's yourself, but, you know, yeah. So. Mr. McKinley, thanks very much. You're welcome.